Welcome, welcome. We're so excited that you all can join us in this special way for the Environmental Science Center's second virtual beach walk. We are so fortunate to be able to put these on from sponsorship by the King County Flood Control District, from Ryan 9, from Shin Yuen Foundation and Foundry 10, and in partnership with the city of Burien, as we have four naturalists out on the beach at Seahurst Park in Burien, Washington. So we typically do this every winter. We're so excited to do it again. My name is Carly Rose and I will be taking some of the questions uh, so that we can relay them to the naturalists in the field. If you are in Zoom, please use the Q&A or question and answer section at the bottom and just type your question in or put a check mark next to a question you wanna know the answer to as well. If you're on Facebook, please just put it in the comment section and I'll try to relay that to our field naturalist as well as a virtual naturalist we have with us tonight. Hi everyone, my name is Alyssa. I'm a naturalist at the Environmental Science Center and I am here in the coziness of my home while our other naturalists are out uh, in the cold and wind um, finding some awesome critters for us. So I'm gonna be supplementing what they find with some extra information, videos, and images that I will be uh, projecting from here at home. So with that, let's go ahead and check in uh, with Rosie on the beach. Hello, everyone. Hello. I am here at beautiful Seahurst Beach in Burien. It is quite windy, so you'll just have to let me know if at any point you're having trouble hearing me. I've gotten some tips about how to block the microphone, um, so you can let me know um, when it's sounding particularly better or worse. But hello, I'm so happy to see you all. My name is Rosie. As I said, I'm a naturalist and program coordinator with the Environmental Science Center. And you're going to be hearing from three other naturalists that are here on the beach with me today. We're not going to give them a chance to introduce themselves quite yet, but I wanted to let you see everyone's faces before we um, each talk to you. So again, I'm Rosie. Oh, it's getting dark here. I'll just pass off and let you, Jackie, give a wave here. <laughs> so that's Jackie, also a naturalist with us. And here we also have Kelly joining us here on the beach. Kelly is a naturalist and our grant manager. And our fourth person working hard here on the beach is Joanna, naturalist extraordinaire and previous program coordinator and current executive director. I don't know where my light holder went. Hello. <laughs> Sorry, everyone. We're juggling a lot of things here, particularly because it's so windy. It really tends to be blowing around our iPod or iPad on its tripod. So uh, we might have to ask for a little extra patience as we deal with the wind here tonight. But we're also so thankful that it's not raining and it's not too cold. It's actually a really beautiful night here at Seahurst Park. And before we go too further with our beach exploration, do want to pause and take a moment to acknowledge the fact that we here at Seahurst are on the traditional unceded territory of indigenous peoples of this area, including the Duwamish tribe, the Muckleshoot, and other Coast Salish peoples. This has been their traditional land since time immemorial, and we here at the Environmental Science Center are working to be in partnership and relationship with them and to honor them, to honor their past generations, their current leaders, and future generations, and to really show so much gratitude for all of the indigenous wisdom and indigenous science that has given us such a better understanding of this incredible habitat and the organisms that live here and really helped us build such a deeper relationship with this place. So, gratitude. Um, so, whoop, I got a wave from Kelly. <laughs> don't know. Anyway, so here we are up at the top of the beach. I don't know if you can really see behind me all that well. Oh, <laughs> not very well, but we're, we're actually way at the top of the beach. I'm right here by some logs. Here, I wonder if I can tilt our iPod down just a little bit. Can you show the logs behind me? Oh, a little bit. Yeah, you can see them 
okay. What's wild is that these drift logs have really moved a lot since the last time we were here. It's been some big storms. But we're up here at the top with the beach logs and some of the marshy grasses and shrubs behind us. Those alders. Really a beautiful scene with a lot of native plants. I believe that Alyssa is going to speak a little bit about the native plants here and how they came to be here. They haven't been here all that long. And while she's doing that, we're going to, here on the beach, we're going to take a moment to work our way down the beach towards some organisms that we scouted out for you. All right, awesome. It sounds very windy out there. <laughs> Um, so I am going to go ahead and share my screen with all of you um, to share um, some resources for if you would like to go exploring um, on the beach on your own. Um, so I've already popped the links uh, for this into the chat, um, but I highly recommend you check out um, either via that link or by going to our website, environmentalsciencecenter.org. Um, we have got some uh, field guides that you can download there and you can take with your, uh, your family or your friends when you go explore the beaches. Um, during the winters here in the Puget Sound region, the lowest low tides are always at night. So you're going to be going out there um, in the dark with a headlamp, uh, which I highly recommend. But if that's not your, uh, your jam, you can always wait until the summer when the low tides are going to be um, right in the middle of a nice sunny day. Um, tonight, it's going to be a negative 0.5 low tide um, that we're going to hit in about 10 minutes. So the tide is still on its way out on the beach. Um, so again, if you want to follow along at home, you can download our uh, field guides and you'll go ahead and head to our website. And under the Moonlight Beach Walks tab under Public Events, you can scroll down on that page until you'll find uh, that downloadable field guide again to uh, follow along at home. Now, Rosie mentioned also that I was going to share a little bit about the history of Seahurst Beach and behind her uh, in the dark, we could make out some woody debris, some rocks, some of those native plants. And that was not always the case at Seahurst Beach. In the early 70s, um, there was a big concrete seawall that was installed at the beach. And the main idea behind this was to provide lots of space for families to picnic and hang out and also to prevent erosion on the beach. Uh, but it actually had the exact opposite effect. In fact, over the decades that the seawall was installed at Seahurst, the beach actually lowered by around three feet. So three whole feet um, in height of that sand and gravel was washed away uh, because of the interactions between the ocean, the, the currents of the Puget Sound, and um, the seawall. It also blocked off any connectivity between the terrestrial habitats and the forest along the trails at Seahurst and those marine habitats. So it was blocking nutrients uh, from getting to the beach and feeding uh, those marine animals that we're so excited to see tonight. So in 2004, there was a big restoration project that started. In fact, it is the biggest shoreline restoration project in Puget Sound. So, um, a ton of about a thousand feet of seawall was removed between 2004 and uh, 2014. So over 10 years, lots of folks worked hard with the help of local, state, and federal funding to remove the seawall, add in those native plants, all that woody debris, and create kind of that softer, more natural shoreline armoring um, to reconnect the terrestrial and marine habitat, allow that flow of nutrients to occur again, um, and to help uh, in a more natural way to prevent erosion. So it's a huge success story. It's not only made the beach, I think, more beautiful, but it's an even healthier habitat. We're already seeing lots of the benefits of it. We're, we've got nice big healthy eelgrass beds that are returning to the beach, um, which is a great habitat for fish like Pacific herring to lay their eggs. And lots of forage fish, um, those smaller fish, 
like the Pacific herring, um, anchovies, sand smelt um, are returning to the waters. And those forage fish are such an important link between plankton and bigger animals, including our beloved salmon. So overall, the project um, has been a huge success and I would encourage you to go check out Seahurst Beach. Um, so with that, I'm going to turn it back to our naturalists on the beach so that they can give us uh, some stewardship messaging. When you do get out on the beach yourself and do some exploring, there's a few tips that we've got to make sure that we're keeping all the animals and the habitat nice and healthy. Hello, Rosie. <laughs> Hello, sorry, now can you hear me? Yeah. Wonderful, perfect, all right. I'll try to keep my headlamp out the way. Um, Wonderful. Thank you so much for that, Alyssa, for sharing you know, some context about the beach here. So, too, I'm just giving a signal to block the microphone. Is that better? I don't know. Okay, I'm just going to have to keep going. You sound great. Um, perfect. Thank you so much for the feedback. So, we have found our first organism here that we'd love to introduce you to. Um, and before we do that, it's good to review, even for my own self, to check my own excitement and curiosity. You want to review our beach etiquette as we are guests here on the beach in the home of these organisms, trying to remember how to be kind and considerate for all of these creatures. So we use that with the acronym STARS, trying to be beach stars. The S stands for step carefully, trying to walk as slowly and carefully as we can here. It's particularly hard, of course, in the dark, but we're doing our best to still be careful with our feet, knowing how huge we are compared to these creatures. The T stands for touch gently with two wet fingers. So when it comes time to touch the organism, particularly this one that we just found, we're going to touch them very gently and using two fingers that will get a little bit wet from one of the tide pools around. And the A stands for animals stay where you find them, meaning that you're not going to pick them up as tempting as it might be to get a closer look at them, but you particularly don't want to drop them, right? That's a pretty big fall for a small organism. And also, even if they didn't fall, even if we were so careful we didn't drop them, we still might accidentally put them back in a different spot. And these organisms are very simply placed. They know exactly where they want to be on the beach. And if we put them back even a foot or two, you know, to the left of where we found them, that can make a huge difference and can really, you know, really be a make or break situation depending on the organism. We don't know. We have to trust that they know what's best for them. Our R stands for remove only trash. So we find trash here on the beach. If we can safely pick it up and take it home, we want to do that. Well, not take it home, take it to the garbage, you know what I mean. Um, but we don't want to remove anything else. I know I am very tempted always by the beauty of the shells and the rocks that we find here on the beach. Very tempting to take them. But we know that those rocks and those shells are a part of the habitat. They are homes for organisms. Those shells break down and the nutrients in them go back into the habitat and become food or the building blocks for future shells. So we have to leave them to be a part of the habitat. And last but not least, our final S stands for share what you learn. So part of what we're doing right here, sharing with you all, is we hope you go forth and share with other folks that you know. So with that, I want to take a look at our first organism here, which is one that's actually changed quite a bit since we got out here on the beach. So I'm going to go ahead and flip my camera around here and try to slowly move down here. Don't want anyone to get too motion sick. Excellent. Boop, right there. So, 
when we first got here, we went out scouting around, trying to find organisms to introduce to you all. And this friend right here was all spread out and green and uh, tentacly. And I said, oh my goodness, I can't wait to show everyone this anemone. <laughs> and it was all, had these tentacles open, waving around. And then when I, it, you know, we go live, you all come on and join us. I go back to try to find this same creature here. And it took me so long to even find them again. Because they're so camouflaged. I'm going to get my fingers a little wet here. Oh, they are all bundled up tight now. Oh, Ooh, I don't know if you can see them move just there. They crunched and curled up even tighter. They're so irritated that I'm poking them, I would bet. Right, there's these, these, these anemones. So actually, I don't know if this is an aggregate anemone. I think this might have been a moose glow. Um, so the, the aggregated enemies are the ones that we often find in bunches, so aggregating together, uh, bunching up together like that. Um, and you occasionally see them singularly as well, but uh, we all see other kinds of enemies as well, including the moon glow anemone, which are the ones that are, tend to be bigger and have these pale green. Um, uh, tentacles that then um, have little white stripes on them, the white banding. Um, and all these anemones, when the tide is high, when the water is covering them, will put out their, their tentacles to to trap things to eat. Right, all of these small living things float around in the water that like to grab onto it. To, uh, get stuck to their tentacles to have a snack. Oh, I think that Jackie is finding something. Maybe she'll let us know. Oh, Alyssa's um, showing us some pictures. Excellent. Uh, thank you, Alyssa. I, I will say, oh, is that is that the moon glow on the right there? Because that is what... Yeah, yeah so I got, I think that was it. We've got uh, some uh, moon glow on here on the right hand side. So that kind of pale um, anemone that you can see with all of those tentacles out. And then off on the left hand side are those aggregating anemones um, that Rosie was talking about. Um, and like she mentioned, usually you'll find aggregating anemones aggregated in big groups. Uh, it helps them at low tide to all kind of be huddled together because it decreases their surface area or the amount of them that is exposed to the air so they're less likely um, to dry out and a lot of the time like in this picture you can see they end up just kind of looking like squishy sandy donuts so um, sand and shell pieces will stick to the outside of them and that helps keep them nice and wet and cool as well um, and I think the coolest thing about aggregating anemones is that they are cloning themselves like all the time and that's why you get that big colony which is kind of like a um, like a clone army and they'll actually battle other colonies of clones. So one single anemone um, kind of looking like a donut will actually slowly over the course of a week or two will kind of split into a figure eight and then eventually just stretch like a piece of gum and then just kind of snap into two different animals that are just clones of one another um, which is pretty incredible. Uh, so let's check back in. It sounds like Jackie found uh, something cool on the beach. Thanks for sharing those with us. So, um, Rosie, uh, hi everyone. I haven't, I haven't got to talk to you all yet, but thanks for joining us out here. So we were just looking at something that's pretty well camouflaged and Rosie thought that I was finding some things behind us because we were getting squirted with some water. And so maybe you have been down on the beach at low tide before and you're walking around, all of a sudden little spouts of water will shoot up out of the rocks or the sand. And those are typically from some clams that burrow or dig into the rocks and sand there. And I am gonna keep looking for the actual part of the animal that is in the sand and rocks. I'm only currently getting squirted by them. So we'll have to we'll have to keep our eyes peeled for some of those those siphons, the parts that they stick up out of the sand there. But we found another little cryptic or camouflaged animal here, right down here.
here we can see our chitin. So chitins, you, if you look really closely at rocks, are going to be really well camouflaged, but you can find them by their eight hard plates on the outside of their bodies. And you can see, oh, we just got squirted again. And I still don't see the animal. <laughs> we'll keep our eyes peeled. So we have these eight hard plates here. And there's sort of this little ring around that is nice and fuzzy to feel. So we can feel that little fuzzy part here. And they are um, suctioned down so that I can't get to their soft, squishy part that's underneath their, their foot that they're walking around on. Um, and so these chitons are grazers. They're going to be eating some of that algae that's growing on our rocks here. So this one's probably cruising around, getting some, some food, some, some snacks. Um, and we have a few different kinds here. So maybe we'll see some other ones. This is a hairy chiton. Uh, we have a few other kinds. In fact, the Pigeon Sound has the largest kind of chiton in the world, um, our gumboot chiton. So uh, they can come in all different sizes. You can see this one is quite, quite small this is compared to the, my hand size here. It's a pretty cool find. varieties in the pictures here um, but yeah I wish I had a picture of those gumboot chitons they can be like the size of a football um, they're pretty incredible when you do find them out on the beach um, you'll more often find them on the outer coast of Washington where the bigger uh, kelp forests are that's where they're more likely to hang out you're also more likely to find them if you if you go scuba diving underwater um, but yeah, like Jackie mentioned, these guys are grazers. Uh, they kind of cruise around on the rocks like most other snails. They've got little teeth on their tongue or their radula. It's, their special tongue is called a radula. And they use it to rasp or scrape along the rock, kind of like a little lawnmower. They'll just cruise along, scraping the rock with their toothed tongue, um, eating up all of that algae um, and being really camouflaged along the way. Um, and they've also got magnetite in their tongue. So it kind of acts like a little compass to kind of guide them through the world, um, which is pretty cool as well. I also wanted to show quickly um, just a few pictures of the culprits that are uh, squirting them out on the beach. Um, so there's a few different species of clams that we'll see at Seahurst Beach. We see lots of butter clams. Um, we can find some gooey ducks a little further south. Um, and also some heart cockles. And often what you'll see at low tide are these siphons kind of sticking up out of the water. And um, through one of those holes, it kind of looks like an elephant's nose. And through one of those holes in the siphon, they'll suck in water, get any food, any plankton out of it, and then squirt it out the other hole. And apparently uh, our naturalists are being, uh, they're under siege on the beach by these clams. Um, but yeah, if you ever get squirted or if you look down in one of these holes, we'll have kiddos on field trips often get squirted in the face. So be careful. Um, beware the clams. <laughs> All right, let's check back in uh, with our naturalists on the beach. Yeah, so we've moved a little bit further down and we have some animals that are trying to hide from us so we'll see if they are camera shy or if they'll come out and say say hi to us so see if I can get them to there we go uh, well, there we go give them a little so we have our a little hermit crab here so you can see right there we have our hermit crab yeah we can try and see if we can get a little bit closer Uh, it's not not right now, but we'll we'll keep trying if we can get a little closer. Um, but uh, remember when Rosie was talking about one of the reasons we're leaving all of our rocks and our shells on the beach is because our little hermit crab here is going to live in a shell that it finds. So it is related to other kinds of crabs where it makes a hard uh, skeleton on the outside of its body, but it is also going to find protection and will be able to hide in shells that it Finds, and as it grows, it's going to have to go and find a larger shell to live in. So uh, if we leave all of our shells that we find on the beach, we can pick them up and admire them and then put them back. Uh, we can make sure that we leave enough home for our little hermit crabs like this one here. Um, it's also good because 
these little crabs will often hide inside of that shell. So uh, if we pick up a shell uh, and bring it home, there might be somebody living in it, it might be occupied. So we want to make sure that we leave them out here in their habitat. Um, but yeah, we have our little hermit crab here. I will share a couple of close-ups um, of those hermit crabs. It's a little hard to see um, on the video, but here's some great shots of one crawling around. Um, and like Jackie said, they often will tuck away completely inside that little shell and just put their um, put their kind of claw up as a doorway to block themselves off from any predators. Um, if they're if they're concerned about that, it's a great place to hide away. Um, and it can be really hard to identify different species of hermit crabs um, because they are using a different animal shell. Um, but different species of hermit crabs will prefer the shells of specific types of snails. And some of them will prefer like a bigger, heavier shell that provides more protection, more armoring. And some will prefer a smaller shell that's a little bit lighter, easier to run around in, but not um, quite as thick or protective. Um, so that can definitely help you with IDing um, hermit crabs on the beach. Looks like our naturalists are still looking um, for some other critters on the beach. So while they're doing that, I might just share um, some different crabs that you might see in addition to those hermit crabs. So um, like Jackie mentioned, hermit crabs are getting those shells again from snails, but there are lots of other types of crabs that you might find on the beach that uh, have their own armoring, their own kind of um, suit of armor that they'll build for themselves. Hermit crabs only build their armor on the front half of their body. The back half of their body kind of looks like a swirly little soft serve. Um, it's just squishy, it's totally unprotected, and that's why they need to nab one of those snail shells. Um, and when they outgrow that snail shell, they have to find another one, a bigger shell to kind of move into. Uh, for true crabs, um, like this kelp crab that we've got here on the right hand side, or the shore crab that's really well camouflaged here on the left hand side, are kind of left to their own devices. They have to build their own shells. Um, so hopefully our naturalists will be able to find um, some molts or empty crab shells a little later on and we can continue to compare those hermit crabs with the true crabs. But it looks like um, we have found a very exciting critter on the beach. So I'll turn it back to all of you. Hello, this is Joanna here. I wanted to show you this gorgeous purple organism here, sometimes called an orca star, or a purple star is commonly called. And these stars are amazing organisms. How they move is they pull in water through this madreporite, this hole on the top of their body. They pull water in and they push it out on the end of each of their arms. They have these two feet. They'll push water out of the two feet, and that's how they move along the sea floor. Right now, it's hunkered down in this hole in the rock, trying not to dry out. Um, I know it felt wet and cloudy today, but still pretty warm for a sea star that normally lives underwater. When they're hungry, when they want to eat, they love to eat bivalves. So animals that have those two, two shells, a clam, a mussel, when they want to eat, their their backpack is just a little opposite. So we can see the whole in water, sucks it on to that clam, sucks it onto that muscle and pull and pull and pull. And muscles are strong, muscles can pull their shells together. The sea star will pull and pull until finally oh, the clam has to relax, opens up its shell just a little bit. And then the sea star, the stomach is underneath the body. The stomach will come out, go into the muscle, into the clam, digest the clam chowder, and then slurp the stomach back in. So not an organism you'd want to eat lunch next to. It might make you lose your lunch pretty quickly. And also on this rock, we have a cousin of a sea star, another brilliantly colored organism. Got quite a few trying to get the best look for y'all. Maybe we go to the 
going on the, you got underneath the rock here. Here we are. I think this one will be a little bit easier to see. So we've got these orange animals. And they are related to sea stars. They also have their radial symmetry. And these sea cucumbers, they spend their life in this rock. And when the tide comes back in, they push out their feeding mechanism. They'll comb the water for food. They love to eat things floating around in the seawater. So a pretty good life to be hungry in this rock. Your lunch just floats by and you can eat it. Um, and some sea cucumbers, when they get really nervous, they can spin out or eviscerate their insides. The litter was creeping up on her and spit out its sides. All of their insides. So imagine if humans, if we, you know, had a disease that could regenerate our guts. That would be incredible. All right, we have more to show you. We're going to move on to our next animal here, but I'm going to turn it back to Alyssa while we do that so you don't get seasick. Sounds good. All right, I'm going to share uh, my screen again so that we can talk about these awesome echinoderms that you guys are finding. So sea stars and sea cucumbers, um, as Joanna shared, are related. They're kind of like cousins. They are both echinoderms, which means spiny skinned. Um, so you can see on the sea stars, they've got those big bumps, those pedicles along their backs. Um, that are kind of like armoring protection for them. It's a little bit of their kind of endoskeleton that you're actually seeing there um, poking through the outside. Um, and they also have um, some little pincers along their back that they can use to re remove any debris, any like algae or anything that ends up on their backs or barnacles that are trying to land on them. That's why they are one of the few things that you'll find on the beach that there is never a barnacle on the back of. They do have those little tiny microscopic pincers to remove any larvae that's trying to settle. Um, and they're also usually pretty slimy depending on the species. Um, so right now these are all ochre stars or purple stars that we're looking at, same species. Um, some of them are that ochre or orange color and others are uh, that purple color. And here is a great shot of those tube feet working really hard to hang on to this rock at low tide. Um, this is a shot of one of them eating. So like Joanna mentioned, they will externally or outside of their body, they'll digest that food. So when you see one that's kind of hunched up like that on the beach, um, they are hard at work. Their stomach is outside of their body and they are digesting away. So there's quite a few different species of stars uh, that you can see at Seahurst. And um, also quickly before I turn it back um, to the beach, I'll show some more shots of these uh, sea cucumbers. And like Joanna mentioned, they can, they can regrow their guts and sea stars can regrow their arms. So echinoderms in general and really invertebrates in general or animals without backbones are kind of masters um, at that regeneration or regrowing parts of their body, um, which is something that's studied a lot so that we can try to replicate it um, in human medicine so that we can regrow, uh, you know, tips of fingers and things like that. There's a lot that we can learn um, from these critters. All right, I'm going to turn it back to uh, the beach. Hello, so we have a creature here that I myself, this is Rose Deacon, hello. I don't actually know that much about, but I believe Alyssa does. We really wanted to take the opportunity to show them. We, in this little type pool, found a sculpin, a fish, a living fish, which we don't actually see that much. Because the way she or is, we don't actually get a ton of high pools or mostly find things that are living the rock, but in this little pool, we actually have a pool. I don't look, I really do wet fingers. That's one of the things I do know about fish is that even though they just don't hurt them, their bodies are pretty delicate. I think that Jackie's trying to move that rock. Oh, thank you, Jackie. Oh, well, there they are. Um, so little. I'm going to very slowly move my finger as you can see it. 
I'm so glad you guys found a fish. Um, so I've got a few pictures of the most common fish, um, at least in my experience, that I have found um, at Seahurst. So over on the left-hand side is a midshipman, um, which is named after the naval office of midshipmen. And in the uh, Navy uniforms, they've got big brass buttons that go down their uniform. So this fish is named for them because on their sides, they have what looks like some shiny brass buttons. They have these dots going down um, either side. So you can see him over there on the left with those big lips. Um, the male midshipman will guard eggs similar to uh, the sculpin, which you can see on the right hand side, um, which is the fish that Rosie found on the beach. So male uh, sculpin will guard their eggs, which is a fairly common thing for a lot of different species of fish. And like Rosie said, we don't often find the fish themselves on the beach unless we, you know, check under rocks. Sometimes they'll be hiding under there to stay nice and cool at uh, low tide. But often what we will find is evidence that the fish are around in the form of their eggs. So you can, um, you can see in off to the left hand side, those are some Pacific herring eggs, um, which is a really common sight on our beaches. And it's the reason that you'll hear folks tell you not to walk through eelgrass beds. So many different animals, including um, those herring, lay their eggs on the eelgrass. So you don't wanna walk through there because you might accidentally step in their nest. Um, and you can see these little fish are a few weeks old already because their eyes are already developing in those eggs. Um, off on the right hand side on the top, we've got some sculpin eggs. So different sculpin will have different colored eggs and they are all pretty vibrant. Um, so there's some red ones here. Some species like uh, scaly head sculpins will lay purple or greenish eggs. Um, so you can kind of see just the whole, the whole rainbow. Um, and that bottom picture on the right are those midshipman eggs. And there's actually a father in the water there and the eggs are actively hatching, uh, which was a really cool sight to see. Definitely not something um, that you're too likely to uh, find. But I guarantee if you look closely out on the beach, you will find some eggs from either a fish or a snail or something, especially if you head out in the spring and early summer. Thank you so much for sharing all these great colors that are out here. Uh, it has me think of the other question we have about sea stars. Um, someone's asking, are there many different colors of sea stars? Yeah, there are a ton of different colors. Let me see if I can pull that. Um, I've got a slide with some of kind of the diversity that we see, especially here um, at Seahurst and around in the Puget Sound. Um, but the ochre stars come in kind of bright oranges and purples, um, but we've also got some blood stars that you'll see. Let me share this picture. So off on the right is a blood star. They come in those really bright reds um, and kind of oranges. Uh, we've got off on the left top hand side, that's a, a false ochre and they kind of come in this bluish gray um, and they also come in an orange as well, which is why they're kind of mixed up with the, the ochre stars. Um, and then in the bottom left hand corner, that's a sunflower star and they'll kind of be different kind of pinkies, purples, grays. So there's kind of a whole, a whole rainbow of sea stars that you'll see around here. And the only color I can't think of that I've seen is a green sea star. Um, but they might be around. <laughs> oh, and similarly, sorry, we have a question about sea cucumbers, if they can be, if the sea cucumbers can be different colors as well. Yeah, there are, there are a few different colors of them. We get um, some around here called salt and pepper sea cucumbers. That's a burrowing species. And as the name would imply, they're kind of white with black 
specks on them. Um, a lot of the sea cucumbers and the sea stars and other um, kind of invertebrates and animals that you find in the ocean do tend to kind of converge on that orangish red coloring because it's kind of like an invisibility cloak. Um, when you're under the water, those are the colors that attenuate with depth or they kind of disappear first. And that's why if you ever go like snorkeling or diving, um, especially the old school cameras, you put like a red film in front of your camera to bring those reds back into the picture because it'll look kind of a washed out blue. Um, and so animals that are orange and red, once they're, you know, 10 plus feet underwater, they just look kind of black. They just totally blend in. So it's a great version of camouflage, even though to us, it's like, oh my gosh, something red or orange, that's going to stick out like a sore thumb. Um, but it actually makes them kind of invisible. So yeah. Looks like we've got the camera queued up on something on the beat. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. So um, what we're looking at right now, there were a lot of requests for nudibranchs. And nudibranchs can be challenging to find on the beach, especially at night. But one of the things that I was honing in for, looking for, were the eggs. So actually what we've got here is nudibranch. These are Dorid eggs right here. Looks like lovely layers of rock. And the rock that I am, or the, the door that I'm looking for, is one of the hardest and more challenging to find because it is so camouflaged, the particle eating door. But what I ended up doing because if you find the eggs, usually the door is not that far away. Is that Kelly out there? This is Kelly, yes. Hey, Kelly. We've got a little bit of interference with the wind, uh, just so you know, because I, I did hear Dory, but I wanted to make sure you could share that again. Yes, so those eggs, that little snot mass right there, <laughs> uh, is from a barnacle eating Dorid. So it looks like literally layers of snot hanging from the beach. And so I don't know if I'm, I'm going to be able to show this because they are so well camouflaged. Yeah, actually, let's try that. So what I want to do, I'm going to put my finger there so that I know where to find it on the picture. Here we go. Okay. So right up in here, fine. Uh, but it's a soft, squishy mass, uh, kind of dark in color. If you just glance at it, it looks like you're just glancing at the rock. Uh, but that's the Dorid right there. So that actually might be two. Thank you. <laughs> uh, so also what we're looking at here, so there we go. There, there's our nudibranch. But Like we said, for the eggs, so there's a close up of those of those nudibranch, the Dorid eggs. And then they don't travel too far from their eggs. And so that's how I was able to eventually find where the little Dorids were hiding. Um, but another thing, if you notice, there's so much going on on this rock. We've got um, we've got some uh, dog whelks right here. We have giant uh, barnacles, we have small barnacles. We even, in some of these, the barnacles are a little bit open. Oh, there we go. Can you see that move right there? Oh, there we go. They're moving for you now tonight. <laughs> Barnacles, what you're looking at right there is that trapdoor, that operculum. So when the water is covering this rock, that door is actually going to be opened up. And these barnacles are so funny. Their, uh, their heads are actually cemented down onto the rock. So these animals live their entire life doing a headstand. And when 
the water covers them, they'll open up, and they'll actually stick out their feathery legs. And those feathery legs are what's going to catch the plankton out of the air. Apologies for the motion. We get a light down there. We have a crab. So this is one of those crabs that's very common here at Seahurst Beach. Do you notice the dark red color? And it also, you can't see it that well, and I'm not gonna stick my finger in there because I don't wanna get pinched, um, but it's gonna have some tips, the black tips on it, and that makes it a red rock crab. But they're very common here at Seahurst Beach, and they're very strong. So those are ones that you definitely wanna give, show a little bit of respect for. Um, we always tell students when we're out on the beach with them that if it's bigger than your fist, probably best to just use your eyes. And actually, this is a really cool corner because I'm gonna I'm gonna move slow too. Apologies. Hopefully, we won't make you too sick. We're right around the corner. We have our other crab. Uh, here we have a kelp crab. So this little kelp crab has a very cool shaped body and then very long legs. All right, I think I'm gonna pass it over back to you, Alyssa. That was sort of our fun corner here to share. Awesome, yeah, you guys found so much stuff in that little area. Um, so I'm gonna start out, I'm gonna go back to those um, barnacles, um, which are a cousin to the crabs, a cousin to that kelp crab and that red rock crab. Um, they are all um, arthropods. And so they do kind of have a, um, a similar uh, body, believe it or not, inside of um, that barnacle shell. And, um, oops. Um, and they stick out those little kind of feather-like legs um, and they'll grab their food, like Kelly was mentioning. So I've got a video here queued up um, so that we can actually see some of those barnacles at work. So this is barnacles, if you're lucky enough to find them in a tide pool um, or at high tide, these ones, this is a video I took off of the side of a dock um, and you'll just see those little, those little feet hard at work grabbing all of that plankton out of the water. So they actually spend their whole life doing a headstand. Their head is glued to whatever they land on. Um, after they begin their lives as little plankton in the ocean, they'll land somewhere, glue their head down and spend their life uh, eating with their feet. So um, we do see them most of the time kind of closed up at low tide. They just look like a rock, uh, but they are an animal. So it's pretty cool to kind of see them moving around at work, grabbing a bite to eat. Um, now, I also wanted to show a little bit of the diversity of nudibranchs that you're likely to spot around here. So in the center bottom, that is one of those barnacle eating dorids that they found out on the beach and found some eggs. And that's a great way to find them is to look around for those eggs. And uh, like Kelly said, the, the parent is not going to be far away. If you look around, if you found some eggs, you're going to find um, a nudibranch nearby, most likely, nine times out of ten. Um, so in the center bottom there, that's that barnacle eating dorid. And there's kind of two big classes of nudibranchs. There are the dorids, and those are the ones that have um, cirri on their rear end. It kind of looks like I like to call it by the technical term, the butt poof. Um, and <laughs> so if you look, um, three of these nudibranchs here, this one in the top right corner, that's a sea lemon. They've also got that butt poof on the rear end um, that they actually breathe through. So those are, that's a dorid nudibranch and next to it is a leopard dorid nudibranch again with the butt poof um, and those kind of leopard spots on it in the top center. And so those are probably the three most common of those dorid nudibranchs that you'll find here on the beach. Um, and hopefully those names are kind of easy to remember. The, the lemon dora does kind of look like a lemon. It's that bright yellow color and its eggs are bright yellow as well. Um, and the leopard dora has those kind of leopard spots. 
Another great place to find nudibranchs, if you love nudibranchs, like I think so many of us do, um, is on the eggs of other animals because they will love to eat um, eggs of snails, for instance. So in the bottom right corner, that's actually that kind of sandy bit is part of a moon snail egg case. And there are, and well, there's a nudibranch and then some eggs um, that the nudibranch has laid inside there. So that kind of shaggy thing on those eggs is an opalescent nudibranch. And I would say that is the number one nudibranch that I find on our local beaches. And it is just munching away on uh, those moon snail eggs. All right, it looks like we've got um, a cool find on the beach. So I'm gonna turn it back to our beach naturalists. Thanks, Alyssa. So this is a pretty rare find to see it um, kind of hanging out like this in the open, but we found a tube worm here. So we have a little worm. They built that stock, that little uh, part coming away from the rock, and it's kind of like its little house it can hide in when it wants to. And this part sticking out kind of like those cucumbers we saw before. They stick those frilly bits out and they can eat whatever food is passing by, like uh, plankton, little animals or plants drifting around in the water. So this is a pretty neat find because normally we won't see those feeding parts out. They'll just suck their, their oh, 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 did we, <laughs> did you see that? It just did it. You can see now it's um, kind of sucked in those little feeding parts here hiding away, maybe a little camera shy, afraid of, afraid of the light. Um, and so when the water comes back in, it'll stick out those feeding tentacles again and uh, grab its, its midnight snack. We can also show, while we're here, if we have a little bit of time too, um, we saw some chitons earlier. We saw that hairy chiton and we talked about all the different uh, kinds that we can find here. Over here, we have two different mossy chitons. So you can see this part here kind of looks like moss we might find on a tree. Or are those species of chitons over here as well? Well, thanks for joining us out here. Um, Alyssa, did you want to, uh, I can pass it back to you if you have a little bit to share about those cube worms that we found. I think we should hear about some tube worms and then also answer an interesting question about eating. Uh, so someone's mentioning they know some people eat cucumbers, the sea cucumbers, but they're wondering if anybody eats the sea stars. Um, or people, yeah. like do people. <laughs> Let me specify. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know, Jackie, are you there? Did you want to answer? Um, yeah, so I, for, so when we're eat, talking about eating cucumbers, uh, they have five longitude or long muscles along their body, and that's typically what's being eaten in our cucumber. And our sea star doesn't really have that kind of musculature like our cucumber does. And so from what I know, I don't think any humans eat sea stars because there just isn't a good part to actually eat. Yeah, they're they're technically edible, but I don't think they're I don't think they're really going to show up on the menu anytime soon. Well, one other um, question about eating is the colors of candy hermit crabs. Do we know what colors candy hermit crabs can be? I don't know anything about candy hermit crabs. Sounds interesting, uh, right? Yeah, now I want to know. <laughs> awesome. yeah. So I, I'm in sort of the same boat as Alyssa. Um, I don't know much about that specific species, but a lot of things in nature and a lot of our, our critters are going to get their coloration from what they eat. So um, it's, you know, their coloration is probably from whatever, whatever they're eating. And we can do a little research and find out what colors they are. Oh, I th yeah, I think it's more specific to what colors can they be? So that answers that question. Mm. Yeah, those, the kelp crab um, that y'all found out there earlier are often green, um, but if they eat a bunch of red algae, they will turn red. Um, and it works out really well because, you know, whatever they're living in uh, is probably what they're eating and it's what they need to camouflage to. Um, so, yeah. 
perfect. Wow. Well, are there any um, last messages you want to all say from the beach out there since we can't see you? <laughs> They're probably saying stay warm. <laughs> We were, uh, we're just kind of getting getting uh, our camera a little bit further away from the rock so we can kind of give you a wave um, and get our lights on on uh, whoever is in front of the camera here. Joanne, did you want to say, say thanks for joining us? I don't know. Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah we can <laughs> and, and Kelly. She's a little bit of a headlamp. Rosie is doing a very important job. Um, so we can see if we can get, there we go. Great. <laughs> awesome. And yeah, thanks y'all. It was really fun having you here again, find the really interesting critters with us um, and having great questions. Thank you all for being out there on the beach for us. Thank you, Alyssa. <laughs> It's been great learning from you. Of course, yeah. Thanks to our brave naturalists for finding lots of cool critters for us to chat about. <laughs> yes, and thank you all for joining us in this virtual format. It is new, but as you can tell, it, it's still exciting and interesting to know what's out there in the dark, what's under the water, what is exposed at low tide. We appreciate you joining us, and we do have one more session we're going to do. Um, if this is real time for you, tomorrow we'll be doing it again at 7.30 to 8.30 Pacific Standard Time. And if you miss this or your friends miss this, we will put the recordings up on YouTube and we'll be doing it live again tomorrow. So thank you so much for joining us and thank you for caring about your watershed. It means so much to this big community we're all in. See you later.